In a lot of aviation accidents, pilot error plays some kind of role. The degree to which pilot error contributes to an accident can vary. Sometimes, pilot error can blossom in the form of sheer incompetence from the pilot, as was with one such pilot flying a Swiss regional jet on its final approach into Zurich. Crossair Flight 3597 crashed a few miles short of the runway at Zurich, killing 24 people. How did the pilot flying handle this approach? And what sort of history did this pilot have? The date was November 24, 2001. Crossair Flight 3597 was on a short flight between the two large European cities of Berlin and Zurich. Planes of multiple carriers run this route many times every single day. It's one of the busiest routes in Europe. The final flight of the route that day was Flight 3597, which left Berlin at 9pm local time for the short flight over to Switzerland. On board were 28 passengers and 5 crew members. The aircraft that evening was a British-built Avro RJ-100, formerly known as the BAE-146. The four-engine regional jet was very popular among regional carriers in Europe as it was built for the purpose of short-range intercity travel. The air carrier in discussion today, Croissair, launched in the late 1970s. At the time, the airline had a sizable fleet of these planes, among other regional aircraft. The accident plane in question had made multiple flights all across Europe that day before making its final trip to Berlin. It was being flown by two pilots that trip. Captain Hans Ulrich Lutz, age 57, was the pilot flying, while the first officer, 25-year-old Stefan Lara, was handling the radios. The first officer was still new to flying and had only been recently hired by Crossair. Lara's total flight hours amounted to just under 500 hours, at around 490. The first officer was one of many pilots recruited by Crossair to keep up with the company's expansion. Their hiring practices would be brought into question when looking deeper into the flying career of the captain. Captain Hans Ulrich Lutz, despite having a long career and gaining nearly 20,000 hours of flying experience, had a checkered tenure as a pilot. He had worked for Crossair for over 20 years by the time of the accident and rose through the ranks to become a training captain. His pilot training position, however, was revoked in 1991, following an incident where he was responsible for retracting the landing gear of a Crossair Saab 340 while the plane was parked on the ground. The incident caused the airline to write the plane off and demote Captain Lutz. He was, however, still allowed to fly at the airline. Over the years, this captain also had a string of other incidents. These included a near-controlled flight into terrain event in Lugano in southern Switzerland, where his aircraft came within 300 feet of terrain. He also made a major navigational error on a sightseeing flight, inadvertently flying into another country. On top of that, he failed certifications for progressing onto the MD-80 aircraft multiple times. He reportedly failed these certifications due to him not understanding the complexity of modern navigational systems. Despite these incidents, Crossair had still allowed Lutz to fly their planes because of a pilot shortage. The airline, as previously mentioned, was expanding and had been for many years, becoming one of the largest regional carriers in Europe. Crossair struggled to hire pilots during this time, so Captain Lutz was kept on as a captain. Crossair, as an airline during its final years, saw three aircraft hull losses, Flight 3597 being the second of these incidents. The previous year, Crossair Flight 498 crashed just moments after takeoff from Zurich. Poor pilot training played a major role in that incident. Still, the airline continued to operate under its expansion. During the investigation of the crash of Flight 3597, investigators would find evidence that would suggest that maintenance was also an issue at the airline, as an instrument which displays engine performance was installed upside down on the accident plane. On the evening of Crossair 3597, Captain Lutz and First Officer Lara flew to Berlin without problems. Once leaving for the return flight, weather in Zurich had begun to deteriorate. Cruising at 27,000 feet, Flight 3597 was given its first clearance to descend at 9.42 p.m. The pilots conducted an approach briefing. Captain Lutz went about discussing how an approach would be performed and was expecting to use runway 14 a southeastern facing runway equipped with an ILS. 
the ILS being a piece of equipment we have discussed multiple times before on the channel. There are three runways at Xerix Airport. None of these runways run parallel to one another. The runway marked runway 1432 was the runway Captain Lutz was expecting to use. This runway is primarily used for landings. The runway near to it, marked runway 1634, is primarily used for takeoffs and is irrelevant to our discussion today. The third runway here is of keen interest. Runway 28, the west facing runway, is not used all that often but is occasionally used for landings. Because of Zurich's proximity to the Swiss German border, locals in southern Germany complained about the noise of air traffic in the area. As a result, noise abatement rules were enforced, which saw runway 28 in operation for arrivals after 10 pm. Because of this rule, Crossair Flight 3597 would have to use this runway instead of runway 14 as Captain Lutz expected. Runway 28 was not equipped with an ILS at the time and so it was a non-precision approach. Instead, the pilots of Flight 3597, as well as multiple other flight crews that evening, needed to be guided to the airport with an older piece of technology called Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range Distance Measurement Equipment, or VOR-DME. The VOR part of this navigational aid can give lateral, that is, horizontal guidance to find an airport but not vertical information. The DME tells the pilots the distance to the airport. The pilots would then, with the help of the appropriate approach charts, make descending steps. Ideally, the pilots would be able to visually see the airport, but on the night of the crosshair accident, weather was not favourable. At 9.47, First Officer Lara contacted an approach controller at Zurich. He queried about the approach knowing the local noise abatement restrictions. It was here when Captain Lutz realised that they would need to perform an approach onto runway 28 instead of 14. He clearly appeared frustrated by this due to his use of profanities as detailed in the accident report. New weather information came in three minutes later which stated that visibility was 3.5 kilometers with a cloud base of 1500 feet. Flight 3597 was then guided onto a flight path which would take them to runway 28. Captain Lutz then conducted a new approach briefing. There was a brief conversation about the 28 arrival. Though both pilots had performed the approach before, it was flown much less frequently than arrivals onto the other runway. The pilots consulted the approach charts for reference. The charts which were later found in the plane's wreckage left investigators confused. The charts did not detail the surrounding terrain on approach to this runway. There are some hills a few kilometers from the foot of runway 28. These were not detailed in these charts. The time was now just after 10 pm. Another crosshair flight ahead of the accident plane had just landed on runway 28. The pilots of that plane made note of the deteriorating weather they experienced on their final approach. Visibility was decreasing as they said they could only see the runway at 2.2 miles. In the control tower, there was just one controller on duty. The controller was relatively inexperienced. In poor weather, the noise abatement rule can be overruled to allow aircraft to land on runway 14 instead. The controller chose not to reopen the runway due to lack of experience and credentials with regards to closing one runway and opening another. Their supervisor had already left the control tower and went home. Despite this, the investigation would clear the controller of any responsibility. Crossair 3597 contacted the sole controller in the tower at 10.05. The four-engine regional jet was around six miles from the runway, passing over the small towns and villages east of Zurich. At this distance, Captain Lutz, the one flying the plane, did not have the airport in sight. Usually, a pilot is supposed to physically see the airport before continuing a landing in a non-precision approach. If by the time they can see the airport when they reach the decision altitude, they can land. If not, ideally the pilot flying would initiate a go-around. Captain Lutz, however, decided to continue the approach because he could see the ground outside. As he says, and to quote the accident report, 2-4, the minimum, we have ground contact, we are continuing on. What Captain Lutz did not know is that he was nowhere near the airport. The plane had drifted below their supposed glide path to the runway. The captain failed to pick upon the fact that the plane was still miles from the airport when the plane was just 500 feet above the ground. 
As the radio altimeter calls out 300 feet, Captain Lutz was noted on the cockpit voice recorder expressing to his co-pilot, make a go around? Moments later, the throttles were increased as he initiated a missed approach. One second later in the foggy night, the trees which perch out from the tops of nearby hills filled the pilot's view. The plane struck the tops of these trees, causing the plane to catch fire. Seconds later, it crashed into a hillside, just over two miles from the airport. The crash landing and subsequent fire killed 24 people. Nine people managed to escape the burning wreckage. The investigation which followed concluded the obvious, that being that Captain Lutz's actions of descending below their minimum descent altitude contributed to the crash. The investigation also made note that the first officer also did not attempt to prevent the continuation of the approach, suggesting that crew resource management training was lacking at Crossair. The investigation recommended that airlines re-evaluate how they pair flight crews. All aircraft should now be fitted with terrain awareness systems, as the accident aircraft did not have such technology installed. The charts the pilots were using were criticized for not having the regional terrain appropriately marked, and so it was recommended that these charts be updated. Crossair, the airline, ceased operations the following year as it merged with Swissair and became the modern Swiss airline that operates today. Hello, good evening everyone. Thanks so much for watching. I was feeling a bit ill while making this video, which is why I may have sounded a bit off in my voice. I would just like to say a big welcome to all the new subscribers as there has been a big increase of you as of late. So if you're new, drop a comment and say hi. There has also been a significant increase in the number of you joining the Patreon, which is a good segue into thanking my patrons once again for this week. If you want to support the channel further, get early access to all new videos and have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. A thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Avery Teoda, Aaron Wilson, Hunter Haleman, Hector Palmatellas, Joey, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morens, Christy, Leon St. Jennings, Marie Ennis, MG, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, Pacman 7, Pedro Cruz, Really Leary Rarely Larry, oh my god, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Wheatley, Surya Melody, Sleepy, and So FP. Thank you all so much. And of course, big thanks to my generous £10 tier patrons for the incredible support. Ada Montgomery, Ant Sid, Bod Ghost Isu, I hope I said that right, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Epsilon, James Bluke, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, Steve Cottrell, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thanks to everyone who has supported the Patreon, and thanks to you once again for watching. I know there has been a couple of videos that has been heavily requested as of late. I have taken note, and I will get around to them soon. I do have a few other videos I want to make beforehand. Thank you so much for your patience. That's it from me for now, and we're back on the regular schedule, so I will see you next weekend. Have a good day. Goodbye.